Hello. Welcome back to another episode of the Product Uncensored Show. Now, if you're wondering why today's uh, hello was very slightly muted, this is actually a nod to my colleague who actually answers all our Zoom calls like this. It goes, hello. So yes, if you're watching Urosh, this is for you. I'm your host, Colin Pell, and I hope you've been having a good week so far. Um, it's actually been a really busy week for me, uh, but we've also had reasons to, to be happy, and especially from a, from a product uncensored point of view, right? So here's some interesting trivia for you. As of the recording today, uh, this show is still trending in Bahrain for Apple Podcasts under technology. Of course, granted, you know, it's like now 180 or something, like we're literally going to drop off already. But hey, a win's a win, and we've been on that on that particular um, um, podcast uh, series uh, since uh, trending since June. So, yay. And magic number of today is 26. That's the episode you're watching now. So if this is your first episode, congratulations. It means you only have 25 more episodes to go. And to all our faithful viewers and our listeners, welcome back. And before we just jump into, you know, uh, introducing the guests and everything, um, if you're new to the show, just some information for you. Uh, videos are on YouTube. Obviously, if you're watching the video, then fantastic. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and then also click on the bell notification because that's what YouTube wants you to do. And that's what I, what I would love for you to do as well. So thank you. And if you're listening to this um, or you want to listen to just the audio, um, we're on all major podcasting platforms, which should be coming up here right now. I hope I got it right this time. And finally, if you would like to support this show, purely voluntary by the way and it's okay if you don't uh, there's a link in the description um, where you can support the show for the price of a coffee all right that is it i'm ready to go so let me start by introducing our guest for today our guest for today is from singapore he is someone i've gotten to know very well over the years actually um i think it's 10 years i think 10 years at least right um so anyway that's not important. More importantly, he's the co-founder uh, of uh, The Collab Folks. He's a trainer with Soft Ad. He's also one of the founders of the Product Beer Singapore product community. Please welcome to the show, Michael Ong. Welcome to the show, Michael. Hey, Colin. Nice to see you. Yes, it has been too long since we met. Um, yeah, COVID has not been a good friend. Uh, <laughs> hasn't been anybody's friend. But yeah, I, I, I still remember that uh, just before... COVID hit, you were actually supposed to, to come down to, to KL and we were like making plans and everything. And then suddenly there was like, yeah, just, yeah everything just yeah. went bust. So I'm still waiting yeah. for that. I was going to go there for one, one year, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's how, that's how, you know, plans change and we all have to adapt. So how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, things are getting a bit better in Singapore and do hope that, you know, travel will allow us to see each other soon. It's quite unusual, right? I, I've always met you um, in person, either and, in Singapore or KL. And we didn't use food. <laughs> Actually, to be honest, I, I, I really don't like Zoom. Um, but yeah, yeah. We, we, we adapt, we adapt. So yeah, um, yeah. thank you for, for being on, on, on this show. And so, you know, really want to talk to you a, a lot more about what you do, um, especially because it's quite different from... Um, the the some of the other guests that I've had on the show and I thought it'd be always good to get as many a, a variety of people um so yeah I've been trying to sort of uh uh plan out the the guests so that you know I don't get too many of the people I know as well so yes I'm sorry it took it took me so long to to get you on the show but yes you are finally here so uh, it, it's been an enjoyable to watch the the various shows like Mike Dickinson and Sylvia who are really close friends in Singapore also. And then some yeah, yeah. newer people you know, uh, on it. It's been nice to watch the shows. Yeah, yeah. So I'm hoping to to get more, um, yeah, more, more of the people that, you know, within the region, we would probably know people who we think have made uh, an impact. And yeah, so hopefully we'll get more and more of them on the show. But today it's all about you. So maybe you can start by just giving us like the two minute elevator pitch of who Michael Ong is. <laughs> Um, so I like Colin has introduced. I'm I'm based in Singapore. 
Um, although for my work for the last 10 years, I was probably flying around a lot more, like around 50% of the time in Southeast Asia, Australia. Um, recent years, it's been in Copenhagen and Lithuania. Um, for the last six years, I've been focused very much on doing um, product team coaching, helping organizations and teams deliver better value in their products. Um, so I've been very focused on the area. But if I wind back, uh, how did I get to this point? Um, I started in around 99, I think, around that, that period of time. I come from a computer engineering background, started programming at a really, really young age, around seven. Um, so by the time I got my first job, um, there was uh, some programming related website. Sorry, sorry. Can, I, can, I, can I interrupt you for a while? You started programming when you were seven. <laughs> I started programming at seven, yeah. Shoot, man. You're one of those child prodigies. At seven years old, I was still... Yeah. Which is a problem because by the time I was in my first job, I was getting really tired of programming. <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a good thing to, to start so early in certain parts of the career, I think. Uh, although it gave me uh, appreciation for the technical side of, of things. Um, when I got into my first jobs and my first maybe 10 projects, I realized quickly that actually while the technical was really enjoyable and I was fairly proficient at it, um, the challenge wasn't so much that technology couldn't solve the problem. It was that the people I'm talking to didn't understand technology back then. Um, and, you know, we, we could do a lot of things in technology. I could, if you gave me a problem, I could probably problem solve it for you. Um, not the best design. I'm not a designer by trade. Um, I really quite suck at design. Like the pixel pushing is not my thing. Um, I have trained designers in understanding technology, but when it comes to the appreciation of a beautiful pixel laid out in a, you know, HD, I, I really don't care that much about it, to be honest. Um, there are much better people at that than me. Uh, but I focus a lot more after technology into the field of user research and um, user experience. And very specifically, I found user research very helpful for me as I started to understand and appreciate more about what it needed to be done. And then um, in one of the very lucky opportunities, I was with a company, um, iProperty in Malaysia, and we were working on the areas of mobile in the days when mobile penetration was still in a single digits. Well, today it's probably in the high percentages, but in a single digit times, uh, mobile was really interesting to work on. So I, I was doing mobile programming. I brought the mobile research and design together and I was given a chance to be a product management uh, role for very much the first time in my career. And it brought together what I knew about technology, user experience design, and also um, product management kind of like into the same circles of knowledge. I um, was fortunate to be able to do this in four countries, both Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and Hong Kong. Um, so back then when I was, there were not many people I could have a chat with. So I considered that thing I could Hey, Michael, Michael. Um, Learn from, you know, to very few people talk to. Yeah. Sorry, um, let's just wait for five seconds. Um, I think the yeah, internet connection, like... yeah. Sorry, yeah. I'm not sure what is wrong. Okay, I think it seems to have stabilized. So, sorry, yeah, please, please continue. Just that the, the last few sentences were, were a little bit muffled, or rather it was intermittent. Okay, where do you lose me though? I'm not sure. Um, you were talking about having the opportunity to work with iProperty in product management across four countries. Um, yeah, so uh, probably at around there um, that it, it sort of started getting a little bit intermittent. Maybe I start from working with iProperty. Sure. And just start from there. No? Sure. Then you can maybe ask me something sure. around there. I think that can pause for a moment. No, don't uh, worry. Let's, we'll continue oh, okay. with, with all the story, pimples and everything. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, I was very lucky uh, when I was working with a company, iProperty, um, in Malaysia. So the work that was involved was bringing together what I knew in mobile when it was still single digit uh, penetration rate in most of the markets, user experience, design and research and product management into a, in the similar circles. Um, I was given a budget. I was given a small team to work with uh, within a very large organization of about 400 people. And so we had Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and Hong Kong to figure out how would a mobile first strategy look like uh, for a company back then in the real estate classifieds. So um, very fortunate in the sense that I had the work to do. Um, the bad thing was that there was very few people to talk to. 
But the lucky thing is that we had really good relationships with people who had done this before in Australia, like REA. And we have people in uh, Paris, Cellar J, who had invested in us. So we got to meet them, understand a bit more about how they took a mobile first approach uh, to the work itself. So we could leverage their, their experience, but Southeast Asia's growth was simply just much faster than any other market uh, out there at that time. Right? So mm. we were kind of like charting the path forward um, as much as we could uh, back then. So that was the, the fun part. It, it let me really realize a lot of the value of the work in product management, bring different parts of the organization together, like sales, customer service, you know, um, finance, operations, everyone together. And I slowly realized that uh, while I enjoyed all this work and given my technical background, I found that the main value I could really deliver was helping people understand and bridge all these things together. So I, I slowly kind of like started pivoting into about 20% of my time during our property days to focus a lot more on workshops, training, facilitation. And I found that that value facilitation was really the part that I was very focused on. So more people, development, capacity building uh, versus the outward facing product that organization typically focuses on in product management. So when I was leaving and uh, considering where I would head towards, um, uh, opportunity presented itself in Australia and Singapore uh, under a company called Bellabox in a, in a field I had never done before. So mm. by then I had worked with about a hundred clients or projects in my career. And as I examined the work that I've done in logistics, you know, whole gamut of work that I've done, I realized that uh, I was missing the understanding of the other half of the population, the, the, the female market, especially. So I really wanted to get a bit more well-rounded view. Um, cosmetics happened to come up or rather, I guess, beauty and wellness was the category. Uh, went and joined them for a while, um, was the first technical product manager hired for them. I started facilitating workshops with them understanding what was the challenge and they had just gotten their, um, I think, Series A funding. That's why they were able to kind of like bring me in. So it was a really exciting period, Series A time, you know, they're trying to figure out logistics, they're trying to figure out everything, how to deliver something into the hands of your customer, and then trying to make sure that your backends are working with your suppliers. So um, I really appreciated the operational aspects of product management uh, in doing so. So that gave me a bit more of a well-rounded view of what would it take to launch something from very little to something significant in Australia, New Zealand, and uh, Singapore. Um, Later in that, in that part, um, I, when I was thinking of actually moving on after I established my team, I had hired my next product manager to take over from me. Uh, I had customer service essentially reporting into me. I had technical teams reporting to me. I felt that I had really done my best in terms of building a team around the work that I was doing. And my area of interest was really much in people development. And um, Bellabox at that stage wasn't really focused on that so much. They were trying to expand a bit more. So when I talked to the founders, um, they actually said that, what role do you want to take? So I said, you know, given the nature of work that I'm doing, I would love to take up a COO role. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will be my first. And actually a very short time that I, I work on it, actually. Um, so it was about six months of putting everything together. Um, and in, in the midst of this, we were very fortunate to raise a round with FX, um, who gave us you know, a bit more money to expand. And at the end of that uh, acquisition, essentially, I decided that I will move on. Uh, from the whole thing, right? So while I enjoyed doing the work, um, the where my heart lay was really in people development and, and building teams. Um, so I decided to take a break. I went to the US, um, spent about a month over there exploring opportunities, did what I love the most, which is cycling. Um, so got into the Bay Area, met a bunch of people in the Bay Area, people like Rich Marie North, uh, Marty Kagan, and ask them how did they actually start their career in what they did because they were like mm. my role models when I started, right? And yep. Asia doesn't have role models like this. Um, Marty Kagan and Rich Marino are quite rare. So in speaking with them and finding out about their, their history, I learned that they themselves also had done a similar thing. You know, they had pivoted away from just being a product manager for someone, but started to really help teams uh, very early in their career. So I saw that if Southeast Asia really wanted to kind of lift the level of product management. Um, no, I was interested in people development. Could I actually start working on this? Um, so the US trip kind of like gave me time and space for a month, talk to people. Um, somebody tried to recruit me in Hong Kong. 
I mean, in, in retrospect, I'm really glad I said no to, to join that startup, um, mm. which turned out to be very big, but then wasn't what I wanted to do. Mm. Um, so when I came back from the US, I reached out to three founders that I knew, and I wanted to focus on helping startups first um, to see you know, if my skills were useful to a founder. And I was lucky that out of the two, out of the three founders, uh, they were very receptive to it. The companies have grown to be a fairly successful companies. And um, I started helping them on founder coaching, team coaching, and then refine the curriculum and program that I had over the years. Um, then I guess the, the next most fortunate thing was one of the largest uh, media groups in Indonesia uh, headhunted me. And because I was very sure that I didn't want to be recruited by someone anymore, when I tell them, no, I would not like to join you, um, which is very strange. They tried to headhunt me for a head of user research design position. And I was mm-hmm. telling the headhunter back then, like, have you actually seen my LinkedIn? Um, I'm a technical person first. I have a product management background. And then, you know, the user research design, but I can't even do Photoshop very well. <laughs> Are you sure? And they said, yeah, they, that's the gap that they had. So I said, you know, but maybe what I could do for them was that uh, I could give... Uh, what, what I asked and requested a headhunter was that uh, I'm going to say no to the opportunity, but can you get me in conversation with the CEO? And I just didn't know that the CEO was actually quite an influential person. Um, mm. In conversation with him, when I explained what I was trying to do, um, he said that, why don't you just fly over to us? Uh, we'll pay for everything. Why don't you run a workshop for one of our largest teams, uh, which was called Video uh, under KMK Labs. So this is under the under part of the SCTV group uh, in mm. Indonesia. So I got to meet people like Piku uh, over there and we started working with them uh, very early stages of video development. And we spent about three weeks with them. Eventually, it turned out to be one of the most interesting kind of like, I think, long-term relationships we have as a, as a client and a, and a partner, uh, hmm. helping them develop their teams. Uh, today, majority of the people we have worked with are head of their departments or teams. And I'm fairly kind of like, you know, um, satisfied that the, that the work we did was able to impact uh, so many individuals back then. And since then, we've gone on to work with many interesting companies um, in Indonesia, in Singapore, Southeast Asia uh, in general. Yeah. Okay. So quite a long story, but you know, it's hard to compress. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Definitely longer than the two minutes, but, <laughs> yeah. no, but it was definitely a re- really good, I mean, introduction as to like, yeah, what, what you used to do and how you got to where you were. Uh, and, and yeah, I'm definitely, I've definitely got a lot of questions about your entire journey, right? Because that was literally the, the, the condensed version. Um, but I think the time when you were with, uh, back then it was called uh, iProperty, right? Um, yeah. Was that where we first met? Uh? Was it there? Chances, yes, because um, I was in KL a lot. I, I had spent... At the end of my journey with iProperty, 105 nights in KL. Uh, worth nothing, unfortunately, because of there was no loyalty points with the Mid Valley group <laughs> of hotels. <laughs> so it was quite funny. I, I had, after every mile that I took, I used AirAsia exclusively, I think, through the mm. travel. Um, I had one redemption ticket for one more flight to Malaysia. After everything, I was quite strange, actually. Um, but I believe it must have been. Um, one of the agile meetups or one of the product related stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was the agile, agile one. Agile. Yeah. Agile Singapore. I, agile Singapore was what the conference. I think it was the one yeah. where Andy was talking about TDD, right? I think you were Andy doing Kelp. uh Andy Kelp. Yeah. Because I think yeah. you were the one doing the doing showing us yeah. the the one with the TV. Uh, they were still at the right. the Mid Valley there. So uh, uh, sorry, I was yeah. That was the strange thing because um, I actually unofficially started a John Malaysia number one because Andy Kelp was actually supposed to be the host. Yes, correct. And then he had a family issue and suddenly because I was I happened to be in Malaysia and I was at, going to attend. I was just attending. And then Andy messaged me and said, Michael, I need help. I said, okay. And he said, can you go and order pizza and everything? I said, no, fine. You know, perfectly okay to order pizza. And I said, oh, can you host? And I'm like, what? I'm hosting a... a a meetup in a country that I don't actually even stay in. And that was actually quite fascinating because I got to meet more people through it. Uh, but the sad thing was after hosting the very first one, I don't believe I actually managed to attend anything else after that. Um, it was pretty much usually on a time whereby I was actually not in Malaysia. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. That, that's why I remember. Like, I 
think that was where I mean I, I think we just spoke very briefly. Then it was in Agile yes. Singapore conference that yeah then we then we we, yes, we connected we again. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, very very interesting because I was actually trying to remember. So, okay, where did we meet yeah. exactly? So I thought yeah, I must ask 11, you. It's ten to eleven years ago around there. Yes, Chris, correct, definitely. And I still remember the the, the that that meetup that you were hosting one. It was raining really heavily, and then suddenly, and yeah. Andy said, "You know, oh, sorry, he couldn't make it, but you know, somebody else would be yeah. doing it." It's like, ah, okay, yeah. yeah. So, sorry, guys. Um, I, I know I'm derailing this a little bit, but this is a little bit of a walk <laughs> down memory lane. Okay, so now moving on from your time there, right? You you were at Bella Box um for a while. I'm very curious to know, like, what was your motivation? I know you said you wanted to to sort of explore, you know, um, the female uh, uh the, on the side of product management as well. Um, but why Bella Box? It was a it was a mystery box uh, concept, if I if I if I understand it correctly. Um, subscription box. Yeah. yeah, subscription mystery box. Um, and um, so yeah. Besides that, was there anything special that was? Sort of like taking you to to that because it, it was definitely something very marked markedly different from like let's say i property right suddenly like a one eighty change yeah yeah, yeah. It, it was very different uh when I look through I, so I love spreadsheets like my 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 entire career is spreadsheet plotted I've seen everything so I put everything into spreadsheet I actually categorize every client I work with based on industry and type of project it is and so you know we call it data driven now I I just call it a spreadsheet. It's everything is all catalogued for me, right? So driven. as a personal development, spreadsheet driven, yeah. <laughs> so I spent a year playing a game around spreadsheets, and so I became a bit like, whoa, you know, the way you should product develop everything. So I, I treat myself as an idea of a product, right? And I think about, okay, what, what value do I have to deliver if I were to do this more, right? I've done a lot, but if I were to take it all away, right? Um, it shouldn't be about industry anymore. It should be that my skills that I'm trying to offer and value should be transferable across anyone who works with a human being or people. So I wanted to just try, can it be done in an area that I simply had no clue, right? Um, and so I decided that the e-commerce was still where the space would be. So e-commerce, but in terms of the category of product cosmetics, I'm not a consumer. I'm totally blind to it. Like I had, when I joined a company, I had, one, uh, what's the thing you call it? You put on the lips, lip, uh, lip gloss, lip, lip balm, lip balm. Uh, lip, lip balm yeah, yeah. I actually have it right here. So I'm now actually <laughs> able to at least differentiate brands, for example, like something like this. Oh, I shouldn't show the brand, right? Yeah, but something like this, right? I at least have an appreciation for it after the whole thing. And when I'm running, I'm, I'm like the ideal user researcher. I can go in and ask a question as silly as how much is your budget around buying cosmetics? And no one will feel offended by it because I'm this guy doing user research. And I really enjoyed that phase of it because I, I love asking questions uh, of, of things that I don't know. So when I went in and, and kind of like got to do all that things, I realized that uh, the opportunity around this, around subscription box was really huge. Um, the largest player back then was Birchbox in the US. I studied their history. Uh, Bella Box had been inspired by them, very similar journeys, in fact, in Southeast Asia. And I saw that the opportunity was there to actually uh, get to a point of at least responsibly be able to share with people the type of products that major companies are doing without uh, doing more consumption, right? So the fact was that there was a problem space around samples that were being produced and not being used in retail anymore. And you know what will you do with them? If you didn't get them out, actually they'll be just dumped away, right? So mm -hmm. they actually took kind of like these samples and shared it with more people and they curated a, a lot of it, like really only good products. They made sure that consumers who didn't have access to some of these things got access to it. And if they wanted to buy from it, they could buy a, through a supply of it. Um, a lot of good Australian brands, a lot of good brands they're working with. And that really had a very good uh, data play behind that, actually. So uh, when we first started, actually, we were organizing all the boxes by spreadsheet. So for, yeah, for the thousands of boxes that were being sent every month, uh, the founder was doing it on a spreadsheet. And when I when I sat next to her and saw the that the strain of you know trying to do a monthly box where we had about a week to basically think about what our customers wanted and do a spreadsheet around it, I tried it for about three months and I really really wanted to scream my head off. 
And then I brought my technology brain into it and I said, okay, if we were to apply technology to this, what can we do? How will we scale, right? So we were able to combine consumer preferences of the sampling part of the business because we could know actually what they were sampling. So in a box of 10 samples, if they liked sample A to you know, the five samples, we would know what they liked about it. And we could tell the brands actually what the people liked about it. So in a, in a way, we are doing consumer research, but in a very modern way of doing it. And by doing that, we were able to customize future boxes for them as much as we could. And the spreadsheet, was, it did everything, but then it just couldn't scale because there was human limit around it. So uh, yeah. my tenure over there was to bring um, people on board to try to craft a, a better product to be able to solve it. So mm. uh, while the entry point was cosmetics and female beauty and wellness, the underlying pieces were just things that I knew how to do. And I just like solving problems that, you know, founders typically, maybe they are not technology oriented. They have been trying to solve it as best as they can. I just like going in, seeing a way to hack it, you know, find a way to hack the problem using the things I know and then uh, solve the problem for them. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. Then she, she doesn't have to worry about a spreadsheet every other month, right? It's like a bit crazy. Yeah. Yeah, but spreadsheets spreadsheets are essentially the first tool of every startup, isn't it? Like even even my last oh, two yeah. startups, everything was run using spreadsheets. And then when you go, it's like, oh, yeah. okay, so this is the spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah. And then we link it to that spreadsheet. It's like, okay. Yeah. And then, so yeah, the yeah. whole entire process is pretty much, like I said, spreadsheet driven, right? And they're like, okay, yeah. so if somebody keys in a wrong value here, yeah, yeah, then the whole thing goes off because, you know, we take the value and then we, you know, we use a yeah. formula. I'm like... Okay, very good. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I totally I can totally understand like you know when you're telling me about the the part where, uh, the company was you know using spreadsheets to track and then see how to make because because um one of the companies I was working with same thing right we they, they used operation teams used the special like wow this is so prone to human error so, yeah yeah, yeah. amazing yeah. but really low tech so it's accessible in a way yes but, yeah for scaling not not. Suitable. Correct. Yeah. When you're trying to find like product market fit or, you know, you're just trying to figure out whether this works, this is probably the best solution. Yeah. And then after that, like, okay, now we've got to figure out the way to make sure that, you know, somebody doesn't type in 100 instead of 10 and then suddenly you've got 10, oh, 10 yeah. sets of the same thing. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, let, let's then uh, move along to the collab folks, right? Um, One of the things that you were saying, um, you, you were telling me just before we started recording um, was that, you know, um, your role or, or how collab folks works is that uh, they do product team coaching. Um, mm. And I'm very curious to know, like you were saying that because it's, it's different from consulting. So, can you explain to us, like, what is the difference between consulting and product team, like product consulting versus product team coaching um, to you? Maybe I have to ask you then, what's the definition of consulting for you? Just kind of curious. Um, I guess for me, consulting will be anyone who's doing like product management as an external party that's trying to identify a problem for their client and then mm. uh, giving them a solution of how to, to move forward. So that, that would be in my, like my ballpark definition. Yeah, yeah. So the focus on, on consulting typically is bring expert knowledge of a form in an industry or domain that really is ex- expert and specialized to provide a solution to a problem uh, of some form, right? In, mm, in a way. Mm, uh, mm. In, in a way, I would say that our area of consulting is very, very different. Uh, we typically do not worry so much about the product that is going to the hands of the end user or the customer. And we are focused on the people creating the product, in a, in a sense. So our focus really as an as a, as a area of like definition, uh, we do a lot more team coaching specifically on the people creating the product. And so I kind of differentiate that from consulting because you know, I have no specialty usually with the clients I work with. I, in, in Collect Folks, I work with people in energy, utilities, oil and gas, um, insurance, banking. I've never worked in any of these domains actually, and I do not wish to work in these domains, right? Because uh, ultimately, I'm not the domain expert and neither do I proclaim myself to be a domain expert. Mm. Maybe if you ask me something about real estate or beauty and wellness today, you know, maybe I can tell you something about it, but my knowledge will be outdated for a very quick time. Mm. However, mm. when it comes to people, uh, given my experience in the last 20 over years working with uh, by now 150 clients plus, and also in three different community of practices in agile, user experience and product, um, the patterns that I see that I know how to help is typically in team development, communication, language, uh, process, right? 
So I can help them a lot in this area. So the consulting that we do is a very different form, focus on people. And, and in the end result, we very rarely tell them actually uh, do this or do that, right? I don't go around telling people do a roadmap of this way, do a kind of model. But I know how to do all these things. My mm. role is no longer to provide the answer to you. My role is to actually help you see that you know the answer. And frequently, mm. actually, the teams that we are helping, like the very first client we with at KMK, um, they didn't just arrive into video the product just by accident. The guys knew what they're doing. But the way they're doing it, sometimes maybe no one is asking them the hard question. Have you seen a different perspective on this? Have you actually considered um, other approaches? Have you considered looking at other people? And some people can, as they work on the product, they are very passionate about it. They can be very inwards looking. My role as an external coach is to help them see that maybe there are potential ways that require different perspectives. Maybe just even talking to your competitors, for example. Right. Mm. It can be mm. a very uh, liberating thing to realize that your competitors are facing the exact same problem you're facing and yeah. you're solving the same problem space. But what if by tackling it together, you solve the problem space faster? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it's really a, 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 I find it's necessary to have a distinction around this in Southeast Asia because um, there are many of our clients are very used to consultants telling them what to do. But yeah. let's just maybe can agree on one thing, right? No one knows how to solve the problems in the future. Mm. Yeah. So mm. to, to walk around, to tell anybody, I can solve your problem, I feel is uh, very uncomfortable for me personally. And I decided that I won't do it. That's why I wanted to choose and pursue a, a different path around that. Mm. Um, mm. But okay, I mean, that's that's fantastic, by the way. So um, I think the way you've, you, you're approaching the product coaching space is quite similar to one of the other guests that I've had on the show, uh, Rajesh Nirlika. Um, he's also a product coach as well. Um, so I think there are parallels um, there. Um, so for those of you who are keen to, to, to listen, it's, uh, I don't know, somewhere up here. I can, I can never get it right <laughs> until today. So sorry, I'm not, I'm not that polished uh, YouTuber thingy, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> sorry. The, 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 the point That's what we love, man, Colin. <laughs> yeah. Don't be polished. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Always good to know. Always good to know. Um, but the point I was going to make is, how do you then, when it is so ambiguous, right? Because it's easy. Sorry, let, let me let me collect my thoughts here so that I I phrase it up properly. It's it's easy to say, okay, as a product person, a product manager, you have to be, um, you have to be comfortable with ambiguity, with gray areas, and things like that. And that's a given because you're hiring that person. But how do you then convey that as someone who's coming in to help the organization? Because you're not telling them, I'm going to give you savings of X percent. I'm, I'm not going to give you, you know, consumer yeah. growth of X percent. You're literally going there and tell yeah. them, I'm not actually sure like what we're going to do, but I can help you to improve. So how do you convince yeah. people to then say that, oh yeah, sure, come in and we'll pay you for that, right? Because technically the thing yeah. that people hate the most is what they don't yeah. know they're going to get out of that engagement. Precisely. Now, we don't have an easy time. Uh, we rely very much on word of mouth. People who have seen success in working with us. Mm. We promise no short-term uh, improvements. Uh, all our work is very long-term. Uh, typically, you know, the work itself can maybe take three months, three weeks a day, but the results typically take a long time to achieve. Very hard to quantify. Um, how do you quantify somebody's satisfaction with their career? Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> I, I think very difficult. Right? So I, I, don't, I don't walk around promising that we give you 100% customer satisfaction that mm. you will get a, a career improvement or you'll get your next CPO role. If I can predict that, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I, I'll just walk around doing predictions and buying for d right? So <laughs> I'm just being realistic, right? Uh, I understand yeah. the, the question you're asking, but the outcome mm. that I'm focused mm. on really is about engagement. Yes. And truly speaking, is or rather the lack of engagement in teams when it comes to solving the problems that they don't care about. So how do we get people to be motivated enough to work on problems that they care about? How do we get them to solve things in the problem space, maybe not that interesting, but there could be something unique inside there to look at. So there's a lot of dimensions in that. Typically, when clients come to us, they often um, come to us with a few patterns. Uh, for example, their teams are not communicating very well. Then we ask them, you know, really, what, what is the real deep-seated reason around that? And eventually, if we ask enough whys and a simplify why pattern, uh, you'll find that it's usually environment. It could be management style. It could be the way the safety is set up that nobody dares to speak up. And in Asia, especially, uh, we are just very used to a command and control. Let me tell you what I think as the boss, you just do and you follow. Um, 
it doesn't really gel well in a knowledge worker uh, environment. You know, mm. you have to trust that people know what they do. Um, and most importantly, how do we create an environment whereby uh, we don't assume we know everything, but we are willing to learn stuff, right? So if mm. I'm able to then increase the level of uh, knowledge building as a knowledge worker, helping them to be able to learn better and learn more efficiently and you know, communicate better, uh, these outcomes tend to translate into quantifiable objectives, key results if you want to, right? But we mm. don't go in to tell them that uh, you should be doing this measure, that measure, because I'm not a domain expert. How would I know what you should be measuring? I mean, mm. yeah. but you can advise me. Maybe. If you want to improve, let's say, customer satisfaction by 20%, I can give you some guidance of what you may need to do to organize certain things and help you think about process, right? So one of my um, earlier history of my work, I'm a business process analyst. And so I have that part of my brain. I can, I can switch it on if you need me to do it, but I would prefer that the client um, makes the request clearly to me. And I don't tell them what to do first because the, the patterns are usually quite different for different environments. Mm. Right? So um, short answer, uh, it really depends, which is the hated answer in consulting. Uh, but that's, that's, that's also one of the most important answers that I've come to realize product managers always use, right? Um, well, how do you do this? Well, it depends. And that, that's usually the, yeah. that's usually, the, it's not a yes, it's, no answer. <laughs> yeah, it's context, right? So if you, yes. if we work with, a, let's say a series A startup, very easy actually, there are certain metrics you should follow. You mm. should pay attention to this. We can tell you, mm. and you, you keep following them, you will see the results. If you are a series D, series E, billion dollar funded company, to be honest, <laughs> yeah, it's a different ballgame. Right. Mm, so mm. the problem then usually it doesn't even have to do with metrics anymore. The problem then is to be that you're too big for your own good. So um, you probably won't like the answers I give to you. So it depends on whether then the founder or the CEO is willing mm. to listen to the hard truth. Um, yeah. And not many of them actually are. Mm. Actually, you 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 you're already going into the follow up question that I had, right? So, um, there was a session in one of the I think it was one of the Agile Malaysia sessions that we had a, a, a few years back, and there was a consultant from McKinsey who was talking about you know digital transformation and how they were in, trying to incorporate agility into the processes, right? And uh, I asked this question of uh, so most of the time, right? In many cases, the problem is not the tools, it's not the product. Actually, a lot of the times, it's actually the people who are up top who are making the decisions. And so I'm, I'm asking you the same question as well, right? So when you have like, like in that example that or in that scenario that you just mentioned where it's the hard truth, like literally, mm. like how do you go tell a CEO, for example, mm you're not really doing your job right. Like, how would you approach that kind of a conversation, especially if, you know, oh. that the CEO is the one who hired you, right? It's like, hey, Michael, come yeah. in, you know, tell me what's wrong and yeah. now it's your job to go in and tell them, I know I've been observing and kind of the problem is you, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so in, in this context, you have set the, the, the situation to be the CEO has hired me. And, and in this case, that means the trust is high enough that they are probably hiring me to tell them the truth. And mm. if they didn't want that, they probably won't hire me in the first place because my reputation isn't known to be going in to tell them uh, the cosmetics stuff they want to hear. Like they can hear it from their own management if they wanted that, right? Mm. So I, I go in to tell them the truth if they hire me. Uh, but then I also tread carefully, right? I mean, you don't get to become a CEO of a certain uh, nature without a level of ego, power, and authority around that. Uh, what they really want to hear from us is actually more perspectives from the people. And so I often am probably not the best person to tell them. I would create a situation or environment and facilitate such that the people internally can build up the courage to tell the CEO what they actually think. Um, that takes a bit of time, a lot of trust mm. building uh, to do that. And it's not very frequent that we get to see that. But when we do get a chance to actually facilitate conversation like this, uh, this very becomes a very powerful narrative for a leadership team, right? That they mm. themselves agree that actually they can recognize that they are the problem and they can see that they know how to solve this. And once they are able to kind of like create some sort of uh, 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 prioritization for themselves, um, they can actually start to pinpoint actually where they want to do it. And I often say, you know, leadership needs to lead first. Um, the, the problem space with in, the, in that process-oriented, you know, um, agility approaches tends to be a mandate from somebody, let's do agile. And very frequently, the person saying the same, that word 
has no clue about that. Um, in their own lives, in their own teams, probably at the leadership level, at the board level, practices none of that. Um, it feels very disconnected. You yes. know, it's like the captain of a ship in the bridge um, doing everything completely different from the person driving the engine of the boat. If you were to imagine that as a scenario, um, where would the ship be heading towards? It's confusing, right? The guy at the engine is probably taking, when you tell me to turn left, do you mean like left 10 degrees, left one? What do you want me to do? Mm. Right? So you do have clear communication. Leadership needs to lead first. Get your, I mean, this is a product uncensored. Get your yes, shit together, right? Exactly. No it. worries. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, don't worry. You're free to you're free to use any vocabulary that you so choose because yes, it is already uh, advertised with a big warning is the uncensored show. So yeah. So we never <laughs> yeah. know if children are listening to this, you know, you're you're popular in Bahrain or something. There could be some kid, 12 years old, listening, I want to be a product manager. You know, that's so uh, I'm going to be just a bit more toned down for a while. Oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So hopefully, you know, if you're you're a 13 year old in Bahrain, yeah, thank thank Michael for you know thinking about you. <laughs> okay, so um so last last question on this, I think uh before before we move on. So my last question would be like, you know, given your experience in going in and tried helping to identify areas of improvement, not so much just providing solutions, right? But you're trying to create environments for growth, uh, uh, environments for improvements, for satisfaction. So if let's say I'm a product manager. I'm not, I'm not a coach. I'm not a consultant, but I work as a product manager and I'm having issues with the way things are going. And most of the time in product management, this is quite common, right? You, you, you want to get something done, but your, your roadblocks are either the process or your roadblocks are the communication with other departments or sometimes even the CEO. CEO is adamant that he or she wants to go A and your data and your research is telling you go B. What would your advice be um, of how how to best tackle this. Mm. So I've I've one approach which I call the shit wall. Uh, I didn't coin the term. Uh, somebody from uh, the UX strategy site actually coined it. And when I did it, I was like, wow, this is amazing. Mm. Right? As a product manager, you often find yourself in a position of a lack of authority, direct authority. People mm. don't report into you. You, however, need to build a lot of influence around convincing people what is the truth, right? And in, in, for human beings, nobody likes the person who goes around shouting at the top of their voice, this is the truth. Yes. You're going to get, yeah, you're going to get all sorts of daggers at you because nobody wants to be unsafe. They want safety. Don't tell the truth. We want, we want this level of safety. Um, mm. So the shit wall is a fantastic way to gather the problems in a conversation. Um, and I would just usually put up a shit wall in operations, in customer service, in sales, finance. And I will try my best to make this as um, visible as possible and just gather data. So be a data-driven shit wall person, put everything together, make it visible. Um, we used to be able to do this easily when we work in the companies, but you can use Miro today. Mm. Just ask people to put things that is uh, not only the, the bad things, right, but also the, the good things. And if the bad things start to already overwhelm the good things, you know that there's something is going on. You need to start thinking about that backlog you have to focus on. Is it really important to focus on the backlog for the customer who is holding the mobile app in their hand, assuming it's a mobile app, or is it more important to fix the problems inside the organization, right? So if you fix the problems in the organization, usually you will get to better engage people, you get happier internal team members who will then have the energy and bandwidth to work on the customer-related stuff. Mm. So it's just a matter of taking the backlog as a total view of a company, not just the feature backlog of ABC feature on a mobile app. To be honest, that is really the least cosmetic thing. It's like vanity metrics. That's like the vanity feature you're working on. Mm. Um, a true feature in a company backlog may be as simple as provide training for the guys who don't know how to do this. Give them maybe 20% of time to do some hackathons. These little things can be, oddly enough, much more effective than trying to organize a road mapping workshop for no good reason, right? So it's mm. just um, understanding your, for the lack of a word, uh, the debt that your, your company is facing. And mm. that can allow you to just prioritize really, really well. So. Okay. Well, thank you for that. So for those of you who are listening or watching, go and Google up what a shit wall is and go and implement it. And <laughs> if you do... Do we not want to, <laughs> to Google shit wall though? <laughs> yeah, actually, that's quite true, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not, not the best idea. <laughs> yeah. It, it, okay, just, just to put it more clearly for those who have difficulty, like what a, you know, um, it's just a timeline. 
you know, of maybe a three month timeline. Um, I, I like three months as a, as a gathering point because, you know, a, a day is not a pattern. Mm. Two weeks is not a pattern. Three months, often if something happens fairly enough, is a pattern. And then just an emotion, you know, from maybe plus 10 to minus 10. And that's a simple timeline that you can gather. I'm sure there are better names for it. I just don't like to, I like, I like this name. So, yeah. Slightly, slightly controversial names because it, it elicits yeah. some kind of an emotion, right? Yeah. Um, some, some people in the agile world call it a retrospective, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I wasn't yeah. expecting. Was you didn't expect- realize. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah some people in the agile world call it a retrospective. But a retrospective done over a period of time. Okay. okay. That's the main difference. Yeah. Mm, very interesting. Um, okay, sorry. I, I said it was the last question, but I now have now a yes. new new burning question to ask you, right? So okay. um with with COVID like restricting our travel and everything, right? How have yeah. you been able to continue doing these kinds of coaching? Because like are you oh. are you doing it like virtually? Like does it work the same way? Is it as effective? Um yeah. I have a secret transporter transporting me around. <laughs> <laughs> No. Very nice. Like, you like, like everyone who is listening, uh, who hasn't been able to travel, like you, I'm also stuck, uh, in a certain way in wherever I am. So this room mm-hmm. that you're seeing, I purposely showed this room instead of virtual background. Um, it's a as a room whereby I've been working out of for the last one and a half years, which is very strange because um, I've never had to. I've always mm-hmm. been in a client on site environment, always been able to fly in uh, with someone if I needed to do, and I preach the idea of face-to-face and in-person. And then now the face-to-face is a different form. I mean, we are still doing face-to-face, at least me yeah. and Colin. Mm. Um, but the, the physical presence no longer are there. So I'm very fortunate in the sense that because of the work I did with my property 10 years ago, uh, I was based in Singapore. My team was based in KL. So I had to learn how to work remote in the very early days. And um, I remember when I, we were using remote tools, uh, what is called Miro, Miro today, uh, we used to call it real-time board uh, in yes. the early days. I, I wish back then I had a foresight to just, you know, yeah, do something around the area. I didn't. But but I've managed to leverage uh, technology a, a fair bit. Right? So I use Zoom quite a lot. Uh, I use Miro a lot. I'm experimenting with different tools and I feel a bit more like a presenter uh, nowadays. And mm. um, I mm. think that's, that's very fortunate. And last year, I think um, in what I thought would have been the worst year in Collect Folks history, given that we are going fully online, uh, we were fortunate that I had a program running for a client in Southeast Asia, a regional program. So I was working with participants from the whole of Southeast Asia who were supposed to be flying to KL, actually. That was the group that was going to fly to KL. So 93 individuals were all flying to KL, learn how to be facilitators, how to be coaches, Ended up, I had to pivot the whole program uh, into teaching them how to do online facilitation. Um, and just by trial and error and a stroke of luck, um, I now have the tools, I have the experience sufficient to do it. Mm. And I'm continuing to push the boundary a bit more with, um, like for example, Product Tonic Lab, who is running this year for the community. We are now equipping people in the product space. How do you run some of these things in a virtual environment? How do you pay attention to energy, which is very difficult? in remote, yep. how do you pay attention to engagement uh, in virtual? So mm. it takes a bit of persistence around it, but there are actually um, many people we can learn from, not, not just um, our field. People in entertainment have been doing this for a long time. Um, you know, People mm. in Broadway have been doing this for a long time. So I, I start to study how other people are doing it. So treat it as a product management problem space, do a bit of competitive analysis, do a bit of data, a spreadsheet, comes together and then um, I'm starting to form the ideas of what would a product look like around this but then um, thankfully there are many smarter people than me uh, who are doing this type of stuff so I'm starting to see really exciting work come out of the, the space actually yeah. mm, mm. okay okay yeah I, I won't I won't go any more into this because otherwise we're going to go down this rabbit hole oh, yeah. really really deep um, <laughs> no uh, because because the, the other the other section that I really wanted to pick your brain on is actually about building product communities right um, so mm. you've been involved with Agile Singapore. Um, you started um, Product Beer uh, Singapore. Um, you also did uh, Product Tonic as well, which is sort of this um, regional like collaboration. So mm. I I would easily say that you 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 can talk your walk because you've done all of this, right? And I suppose the question that comes out is, you know, 
let's start with the why. Why did you why did you do all this, right? Was it was it because you know mm. for you it was something that was valuable, or you know it was a need at the time? What 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 was your why? I like I like pain. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I probably like pain a certain amount, right? But um, I started really early in technology, so I was, I was part of very very good technology forums. Uh, back then we had BBSs and forums. Very little in-person meetups until the very first in-person meetup was WebSG for me. Mm. Um, and, and then we could just come people come together and I met someone who hosted for the, for the sake of giving back uh, when he was a bit more senior in his career. I was really interested that I was consuming a lot of these services and effort people were doing in community. So I finally got in a position whereby, you know, at iProperty, I had space, I had a venue, I had a boss who was very, very encouraging, uh, Andy Kelk. And we thought that, you know, if we could do something around this, like given what we had opportunity-wise, uh, what would we do, right? So I actually didn't start in Agile uh, directly first. Uh, I actually was working in UXSG for a while. Um, mm. I was one of the early volunteers with them. And so through that UXSG environment of working with designers, I came to really appreciate what it would be like when you were able to bring uh, much more experienced senior people who have a very shortage of time because time is a resource that no one really has, right? You have family commitments. You're now VP product, VP design, chief design, chief product. To be honest, your days are consumed by guiding your own team members. Mm. To expect you to give back to community is a very big ask uh, already. And But then the, the problem space uh, really is about career development for junior people who are not getting the attention that they need from certain of their bosses sometimes, right? Not because the boss don't want to, but they have mm. other problems to solve. So mm-hmm. the community events became really like an uh, environment we could learn about problems. We could sometimes help each other when we can. When we did the conferences, it could inspire someone to do more because the companies who would, would participate tend to share very powerful stories, like Philips, for example. Um, Alessian will share a story about them. And you could see the young people start to really get inspired about it. And in the UXSG field, we started to see user experience in Indonesia, UXPH, community starting to form. You will have students, young professionals, experienced professionals coming together. And I've been talking to some of these individuals for over 10 years. I can see that as a part of that work, which is very unquantifiable again, there is a real growth in the individual, right? Mm. And then when I observe this in the agile community, the same thing happens. And when it came to product management, there was a real lack of it. Um, I was very, very lucky. We had product camp, the very first one, uh, with people like Sander, Wen Huang, uh, um, and one who is now in, in uh, Europe. We also had Adrian Tan uh, from the Australia side of things help us and give us advice. We had people like Rich Mayunov who was helping out to share information. Marty Gagan was writing a lot and sharing. Um, Mind the Product was running in London. PMF was in Europe. I was lucky enough to be able to fly and see some of these things. And I realized that um, not everyone can just simply take a plane ride and fly over to Europe or Australia. Um, just because they want to learn something, right? What mm. if the what if for me was if you can create a local movement around this, not tied to any single company, but individuals who really wanted to lift that conversation level. And so as a result, uh, Product Beer was formed. We really focused on in the early days having beer and having a chat and, and dinner. Um, and eventually, you know, beer is not the most he- healthy product in the world. You know, it's good for you, but in moderation. Okay. So we realized that actually we wanted to have a deeper conversation about that. And we started reaching out to people, right? Colin was one of them. Uh, Vishnu in Indonesia, another one. Uh, people like uh, Yana in Philippines. I sat down with them and talked about it. Yeah. And again, product had same patterns. Everybody is on a different journey, similar patterns. We have very hungry young professionals. We have a lack of senior experienced professionals who are able to give time. And we don't really truly are solving anything of critical nature in itself, right? Besides career development. And so when everything came together uh, last year and running a few retreats, you know, for the Protonic community, I realized that the problem space required a, a shift for us. Um, I had a mentor in the HR space give me some guidance. She had spent about 40 years in public service in Singapore. And he said, that, hey, Michael, you're, you're doing really interesting community of practices, but this is like old stuff, right? What do you really, really want to solve? And I realized that the problem space I'm focused on is in education, ultimately. And I feel that if we can create a movement of people who understand the language, 
how to structure a curriculum, how to actually teach effectively in this new modern virtual uh, world, we could do really something different for professional development. Uh, and that's how I've kind of like tried to walk the talk as much as I can. Although like I truly say you need to probably enjoy this pain a bit in some mm. form because it's strange. Yeah, 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 I can tell you it's strange. Yeah. Mm, mm, but for sure. There's people like yourself around now who can who can talk about it. Now, so that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's always good to know that you know, uh, you know, people like us who, for some reason, you know, we keep we keep going even though it's it's a very thankless job yeah. sometimes. But yeah, I, I think yeah. um, I, I think I definitely have the same empathy, right? Because we've been we've been helped by somebody else, and so we feel like you know, it's 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 on us at least for this period of time for us to to pay yeah. it forward, and hopefully, you know, when the day comes that we we say that you know what. Okay, we're, we're we're tired, or you know, it's time for us to yeah. to take a back seat. You know, there'll be somebody else who takes yeah. over, um, as well. Yeah. But so coming back to to product BA, right? One of the questions that I was always very, very curious is because you actually know a lot of the leaders in the product community space, right? The mind, the product people, leading the product people. Um, why didn't you start like product product mind the product Singapore or you know lead, leading the product Singapore and instead went with product oh. beer? I like drinking beer. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and so I, I started with, um, I talked to 20, 20 individuals in the product space from people who are teaching product management to product leaders, uh, very senior in their career. And I asked them, why didn't you do it? Like, I'm early in my career, right? I didn't have the space to do it even. I didn't have the resources to do it. But when I talked to people, actually, what they were looking for wasn't another um, hour or two hours of an evening to hear someone else tell them about what they did. To be honest, there's YouTube today. There's mm. a book you can read. Uh, we didn't need one more of those, right? And while I think it's very important to have these things in place, you know, I do the same things in UX and Agile Singapore. We mm. run conferences. Mm. But the truth is, in the product space, we need to have more dialogue. And that was missing. And my observations after attending, I'm part of 100 community of practices. I tracked a spreadsheet of 100 over of them in the world. Um, very few actually focus on dialogue. Many focus on um, self-promotion. I took a pause there because, you know, if it triggers you, very good. Self-promotion, right? So mm -hmm. I don't think we need more of that in this world. We need more silence. We need a bit more dialogue about the real stuff and pay attention to what people are saying. Hear the things that people don't have a voice to talk about, usually the younger professionals. I don't think um, it's necessary for us to spend, you know, a whole evening telling about our success. I want mm. to hear about your failures, your lessons learned, the shit you're going through, the shit war that you have. Mm. That's what I'm interested in, actually. And that's what actually young professionals who are growing in their career in product management uh, need to listen to, right? The mm. success is just, it, it's cosmetic. The, the hard truths, nobody writes books about those. And even if a book is written about it, usually it's celebrating success. Of a certain form. Um, yeah. So that's why Proud Beer came around because after beer, you tend to be, you're going to speak a bit more freely about stuff. We record nothing in these sessions. Uh, if there's a photo, it's usually a photo of the food of the beer. Uh, we use some posits, but rarely do we record anything at, at all. So safety of that conversation is, is almost guaranteed. Um, and, you know, it keeps it very simple and light uh, over the years. Um, I think we, we, we hit a hundred meetups in Broad Beer, I think at some point. I can't remember any, when it was. Yeah. And yeah, I remember very little of it, which is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to have an ex-colleague who, who used to yeah. tell me, you know, um, I said, what's your idea of a good time? He said, the idea of a good time is that it's a Friday night, you know, I go and have fun and I'm so pissed yeah. drunk that the next day I have no recollection of what happened the night before. So yeah, <laughs> so, yeah sounds like. Yeah, you remember that you remember the essence of it, but you don't have to remember who told the story because mm -hmm. that that is not necessary anymore. Right? But you at least remember the lessons learned. When you go back to your work after your meetup, after the product your meetup, you can try something out that you heard. If you learn something from it, good or bad, you come back the next time, you share it to the person who told you, you form a trusted conversation path. Right. So mm -hmm. in, in anybody in the product your community, ask me something or I need something. And they share the information. The level of trust is so high that this is as real as it can get, right? So 
it makes it a lot easier to have a real community like this, whereby we are coming together for the sake of helping each other, not for the sake of self-promoting myself to be the leader of the group, right? Mm. So, yeah, there, there's no real leader of this group. If if somebody wants to take over Proud Beer and enjoy beer more than me, please feel free to run it. And um, I think the Philippines group was asking me, can we run Proud Beer Philippines? Said, for goodness sake, yes, go for it. Like, if you guys want to do it. Uh, but then, mm. what's the name? Ultimately, it's about, do you share the same values? And if I go back to your original question, why did I create the same thing like Mind the Product or Product mm. Tank or product something? Mm. Um, our values, the way we approach it is different. I'm Asian. Mm. Okay. I have different values from guys who started the other stuff. I value privacy. I value <laughs> humility. I value a lot of stuff that maybe in a different context is seen very differently. I mm. feel that Southeast Asia requires our own approach to doing things. Um, and variety and diversity, we keep talking about that and inclusion. So we should do things a bit differently, learn from each other, uh, be friendly right, to each other, but respect that uh, there are boundaries we should respect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So last question on, on, on this, this section as well is, um, because you know, obviously you've been doing this a long time, right? What advice would you have for people who are running similar communities of, you know, product or, you know, uh, meetups or things like that, like what's your secret to, to, to keep it going, right? To the longevity oh. of, of the, of the community. What do you think is important? Oh, you come back to me dialogue. I have very frequent one-on-ones with people. Um, un- unbelievable how much I have actually, but um, every single individual who I talk to, and I keep it fa- fairly tight, right? The, the community isn't thousands of people. I guess, uh, again, it's not about quantity, it's about quality for me. And so the dialogue informs me what is necessary. Um, you know, I've never heard anybody tell me, hey, I would like a speaker-oriented format for this session because they can find it somewhere else. Most mm-hmm. people say, I would like to have a dinner. I would like to have maybe this and that. And then I'll, I'll try it out in a, in a community. Um, it's a continuous experiment. Nothing is fixed, fixed uh, as much as possible. We run it as regular as we can, but you know, in recognition of the last year, we stopped. Nobody needs another extra Zoom, right? So we, we stopped for a while. And mm. we're going to come back for a bit. We, we get informed by the community. But I think pay attention that um, I think what I've learned a lot is that essentially what I'm here for is not to lead by telling people what to do in the community. That seems very strange. I'm here more to facilitate what you need, right? So um, it doesn't take much more energy than just to say, I'm free this evening. Would you like to have a beer and have dinner? That's about all that we are doing in this community. And uh, we keep it as open space as, you know, I'm going to use the word open space. Mm -hmm. But those principles really kind of like guide me a lot. Whoever is here is the right person. Wherever it happens at the right time. Um, These are the things that kind of like guide me in it. there are certain values that guide me. I mentioned that humility, privacy, mm. you know, have some courage to say the stuff that you want to say. Um, and just, just think about what you need as an individual, as a community organizer, and don't burn out. Like, try your best, you know. Just sustain yourself. Because it's, it's enough suffering, right? So mm. if you want to burn out from something like this, maybe this is not the best place uh, to spend your time. Spend it with your family, spend it somewhere else. But mm. sustain yourself through this. Uh, keep mental health as as good as you can. Be physically fit for the work that you want to do. Um, you know, so take care of yourself before you take care of other people. I think that's a general summary. I'm trying to say. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So everyone who's listening, watching, I, I think this these are all good pointers that 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 Michael's bringing up. So yeah, if you run the product community or you're facing troubles with your product community, it might be good to. Take a step back, ask yourself the questions of, you know, why you're doing it? You know, is it worth the effort that you're putting in? You know, what what outcomes are you trying to achieve? And, and again, you know, just take it back to what can you do and how can you maintain it? I think that, that to me has always been something that's very important, right? Because if you lose the essence of what you're trying to do, um, yeah, I think that's where you lose your way and then things start becoming more a chore um, than anything else. Hmm. Yes, thanks for sharing, Michael. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I want to just you know jump into another section as well. Um, because you've obviously had a lot of experience um 
spend a lot of time with founders, um, with companies, with product teams. Um, but you, you, you yourself, you've gotten into um, a, a sort of a, a new um, endeavor yourself, right? Um, what do you want to tell us a little bit more about it? Because I'm curious to know. I don't know oh, much yeah. about it either. Yes. Yeah. So, um, like I said, right? I've had a few. I like talking about failure, so I was going to share about that first. Mm. I, I like creating stuff. Um, not maybe the usually the first founder. I'm usually not the first founder. My skills is not in that in that area. Many ideas, but my ideas usually probably wouldn't be suitable. And so I'm very good at helping someone whereby they have identified a problem space, they have an idea. I'll come in. I'll bring my knowledge and help them. I'm probably a very good second person to come in. Um, so I've, I've joined a few founders. Usually ask a lot of hard questions. Some I've spent a bit more than I need. For example, in a bicycle startup, I went for two years before I realized I was not doing the stuff I was coaching other people on. So that really gave me a good slap in the face for that, right? Got very pissed off with that. And I was like, okay, don't get involved in bicycle business. Just enjoy the cycling. That's fine. Mm. Um, the, the latest one comes around in a, in a time whereby um, it's strange. I started a business in the end of 2020 in the middle of a pandemic. Um, why should we be doing that? If I look back 20 years from now, maybe it's a bad idea. Um, but the mission was interesting to me. Um, the, the other founder who came to me is a very long time friend uh, who is based in Indonesia. And he had seen a problem space in helping um, the small businesses in Indonesia. And we felt that there was something that we could do. We had skills, we had um, the, 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 the right networks and resources to be able to do this. So we started working together with small businesses in Indonesia to bring some of the work that they're doing uh, into Southeast Asia and potentially the world one day. Um, technology, as light as I can. I'm using Shopify. If I could use a spreadsheet, I would do it. I kept telling the founder, we should spreadsheet this our way out of it. Right? Um, he's, not that, he's not that convinced, uh, given that he has a different hat that he's wearing. So he said, like, you're a bit crazy. Then I was trying to tell him that even Jack Ma started on a spreadsheet. So why not? Right. So it doesn't mean that we have all these fancy air tables and everything. We need to do it fancy. We can mm. go back to basics. Uh, so yes, I am running the spreadsheets of this company. I'm very proud to admit it. It's fully spreadsheet run at the background. Uh, but in front of Shopify, because consumers probably can't deal with ordering on a spreadsheet. And that's what we're doing. We're trying to find a bit more about uh, the partners that we need to have. And mm. we are going to go in the space of product development. So I'm wearing a few hats at the same time and hopefully not repeat too many mistakes from my last few companies and see where that goes. Um, it's pretty interesting. Okay. So I guess, you know, when we're talking about failures and all the experiences that you've had, how do you feel like your experiences as a product person, as a product coach, has it helped mm -hmm. you to avoid making those mistakes or has, has it helped you to better deal with the mistakes like yeah which part of the the product mm -hmm. thinking have you brought into you know your own endeavors yeah. into your own startups yeah. i think it helps me better deal with the the lessons because very frequently uh, what we are trying to solve like right now um is new right mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's new it's like trying to bring people from indonesia the companies we're working with outside of indonesia for the very first time uh, in a comparator analysis that I've done, a few people have done it, but none are successful. What makes mm -hmm. us think you're successful is just hope and optimism, to be honest. That's one component mm -hmm. of it, right? But that can't fund you, right? right? It, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't fit the stomach. Uh, so it requires a bit of like hard truths, what is needed, what metrics we need to measure, are we making money around this, and can it actually pay the people that we are trying to help in the first place, right? So lessons learned help us deal with stuff. Um, this year has been really challenging. Everything mm -hmm. that I know how to do, we put into place, doesn't mean it will work in a pandemic year. Yeah. I mean, how many of you on this call have launched a business during a pandemic? If you have done that in 1918 or something, please give me a call. I would like mm -hmm. to learn from you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think everybody would like to learn from you. How do you launch a business and be successful in a pandemic? Uh, not many people would say that they can have the experience of this launching from zero to one. So I have lessons learned. I know certain things about what to do, but the truth is we're just experimenting, learning, applying. But mm. what we can do is to shorten the cycle of the learning a bit so that it doesn't become a five-year journey and then falls flat, right? Maybe we can shorten mm. the cycle to maybe about three months uh, as within our, our tolerance level and get a bit better at it. You know? mm. I, 
so sorry now i have another curious question listening to you speak like why why start now then why not wait until you know the yeah. pandemic is over when things have opened up a yeah. little bit more then you know we can go back to some sort of like a new normal right why why do it mm. you know when you started it so i think i like working within constraints so i like to start businesses with uh constraints mm. uh, so the constraints teach us a lot of stuff so the, the typical constraints in any project uh budget time and also the resources that you have right mm. during mm. this period of time we have very little budget uh we're not funded Mm. And we are trying to to avoid funding as long as we can until we need it. Mm. Uh, we have time is actually right now a luxury for us because it's a, the urgency is there, but it allows us this period of time allows us room to maneuver and understand more, right? Which is typically in a non-pandemic environment, things move very fast, um, and you don't even have luxury of time to even reflect at all, right? So we are utilizing all all of this to learn about our partners we want to work with, uh, because it's not going to be just one partner is. No, Indonesia has about 50 over million SMEs eventually that we want to work with. So we can't go from zero to 50 million. We have to go from zero to 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000. Um, every curve has a learning around that, right? So we take the time to just, uh, my partner likes to talk about it in a sense of, we need to learn how to breathe. And this is a period of time, if this is a marathon, we are just learning how to breathe in the first kilometer. Breathe well. Right, be healthily, don't burn out, be sustainable, don't harm the planet even more than it is. Can we do it in such a way that we are respectful of all the things? And it's very difficult, right? Wearing a brown mm. hat today, yep. thinking of whenever I send a parcel from Indonesia to someone, I'm burning jet fuel doing that. Yep. Uh, it mm. keeps me a bit awake. I'm like, fuck, you know, <laughs> every time you you place an order on my website or all of you who are, all of us, right? I shouldn't point a finger at you, I'm doing it. Mm. You are burning some jet fuel doing it, right? Yeah. How do you solve that? Mm. Mm. Yeah. No one is really asking the question, how do you solve that? So if as a proud person, we actually are kept awake a bit about such stuff, it will take us just enough, it will make us irritated just enough to maybe figure out how can we do it, right? Not just for the benefit of yourself, your business, but can we do it for a larger whole of companies, right? That even if competitors, can you solve it for the sake of better solutions? I think mm. I'm really interested in that space. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I think you're very, you know, on the on the on point. I think with where the general awareness is within product management. And, and I personally think that in Southeast Asia, we're also beginning to see this, right? It's not just mm. about creating the biggest consumption. It's not about just the biggest growth, but also like, are we being responsible with how we're doing it? And of course, not all of us are at, you know, have the luxury of being able to be in control of all of these levers. But I think yeah. if we start with asking the right questions as well, like, you know, if we say do no harm, what does that mean for us as product people in the space? I think where we've got hope for, for what's coming next. So yeah, yeah. Totally, totally agree with that. Um, one question here, um, which before we go to the final section of, of the show, um, is I'm very keen to, to, to hear your thoughts around what does the future of product management look like or what do you think it looks like in Southeast Asia, right? If yeah. I were to say like, you know, yeah, what's the future going to be like for product management? Uh, all product managers will be cycling. I'm all doing that. <laughs> no, no, joking. I'm just observing that many people are cycling. So as a cyclist, I just want to make a joke about that. But obviously, you know, what's the future of product management? I think at some level, there's a there's an integration of all the work we're talking about. You can see in the various fields, right? In design, there's design ops nowadays in product. Product ops now come around. I'm sure we're going to get some convoluted product sec dev ops at some day. Um, I I I done one like a ten syllable ten ten word um profession we'll do one day in the future. But just to simplify it, I call it a product person, just to mm. keep my head sane around it. Um, where will it come around? I think the problem spaces that we are trying to solve require to be a bit more than just a T-shaped person. With you know you, you will have a specialist, I'm sure, right? Mm. Technical mm. specialist, design specialist, maybe operations or business domain specialist. But your breath needs to be as, as wide as possible. And potentially, I think some of us would start to see uh, multiple specialist areas, right? So I like to call it the, the three specialists with one 
Uh, so Singapore has a building called the Marina Bay Sands. It looks like mm. that. Um, some of us may have four. I don't know what it looks like. Five, potentially. I hope that as we get smarter and smarter, um, we can take all this in. Um, it seems very much like data seems to be driven, driving a lot of it. I would imagine that if you don't understand security, you should probably pick up a bit of that. Um, so I have a background in all of these things, right? Although, again, like I said, um, out of a scale of 10, I'm proficient. I'm proficient enough to have a conversation. I'm proficient enough to read about it. I'm proficient enough that if I have to make a decision about this, I can make some decision about this. But mm-hmm. then I would definitely know that I need to talk, to talk to specialists about it, right? So as a product manager, I don't think you need to know 10 out of 10 of every single field uh, that is out there today. I mean, recently, um, there's a the Product Professionals Association that was launched. Uh, they map, I'm just looking at the skill map because it's very new, 20 technical skills and six adaptive skills. Um, if anybody is able to score themselves 10 out of, you know, the full range out of 26 skills, you're really impressive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, it. That's all I can say, right? But I think we would just try our best so maybe just do a few of them really, really well. And mm. we have awareness of the rest of them. And then mm. work with people around you as much as you can. That is going to be a sign of a really, really interesting product person, I think. Okay. All right. Thank you for oh, that. There's one, there's one more, actually. Mm. I think there's one yes, more yes. thing. On yes. tech. Uh, given that we are in Southeast Asia, I think understanding culture and diversity is really important. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Which is what other markets don't seem to... Um, have to face that much actually. Yeah, yeah. I think um, even the previous episode I was talking to Mario, who who's from uh, Bukuwarong, and he, they were saying the same thing also, right? The the melting pot that is Southeast Asia is a very interesting uh, melting pot because it's it's comprised of a few countries and very yeah. many cultures that are similar but not the same, and we're all at different stages of growth, of wealth, of health. Um, and I think yeah. uh, the challenge for us is to how do we find something, yeah. you know, do we do we build for all? Do we segmentize what we do? Um, yeah, I think those are all interesting yeah. questions. And that's why I think Southeast yeah. Asia is a very interesting place to be, right? Because the, yeah. the that challenge is very different from more, I mean, no disrespect to any other culture, but, you know, more homogeneous cultures where you're building for a very similar yeah. type. So yeah. That's why I love that we are not homogeneous. Right? I don't need to. I wouldn't enjoy it, I think. Um, mm. That's why I, I, you know, I, I choose to stay here. Um, I, I've never thought of relocating. I mean, a few times I've, I've visited places and made a decision to understand. But the truth is Southeast Asia uh, really excites me in the potential that we have. And actually, it's not even potential anymore. It's, it's proven, right? to be honest, it's not potential mm. anymore. Right? In the 10 years, um, things are really moving very quickly. So if mm. I were to think a bit harder, like what I was talking about just now was just maybe the horizon of the next 10 years. Right? Mm. If we, if we were to push a bit harder into the next 100 years, which by then I won't be alive, and I suspect Colin, both of us will be not here uh, <laughs> unless technology moves that fast, right? But 100 years from now, uh, what will it look like? I'm actually very curious about that, right? When we have solved the problems and the seawater is, you know, already covering most of Singapore, it will probably no longer be an island. Um, that's it, might be a very, it might be a very small island, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why my, my home will definitely be flooded for sure, actually. So uh, what will that look like in mm. the field of problem management? Uh, maybe yeah. we have to ask ourselves then, what are we not doing now, actually, mm. to focus on, you know, the next 10 years, is it important? Or is it the next 100? Mm. Nice. Very good food for thought. Very good food for thought. Okay. We will move to the last segment. So by the way, guys, if um, oh, guys and girls, ladies, gentlemen, um, yeah, whatever pronouns works for you. Um, if you have thoughts around this, yeah, feel free to reach out. And, and like I said, you don't have to like post in the comments or anything. Like just reach out to me in DMs or messages. Um, be keen to, yeah, if anyone wants to have a conversation about this, might be something that's worth just having a, a discussion about. So yeah, don't don't let it die here. But if it festers in your mind, like what Michael says, right, kind of keeps you awake a little bit, maybe it's time to start a conversation around it. But for now, but for now. If I manage to trigger you, you should be having a conversation. 
<laughs> nice, yes. And you can reach out to Michael as well. <laughs> okay. The, the last section of the show is actually uh, where, where, where I re- usually enjoy a lot is uh, the, the, the song, right? So I always ask the guest oh. to, to yeah, yeah. recommend a song. And so, uh, Michael, why don't you do the honors of uh, introducing the, the song and then let's talk a little bit more about it. Yes. So the, the song I, I chose, and I, I like um, classical music uh, quite a lot. I, I, I had difficulty when, when Colin was actually asking what song. Uh, my first thought was like, Dua Lipa. I was like, man, I really enjoyed her music the last one year. For some strange reason, I like the dance. I like the music, very lively. Uh, but the truth is, when I'm working, usually I do tend to work in silence a fair bit. Uh, and more recently, um, actually YC reconnected. Uh, YC and other one of the people in the community reconnected me with the fact that uh, he listens to Bach when he's working. So I was like, whoa, I, I used to do that when I was younger. And I really enjoy classical music because it's just no lyrics. It lets my brain process things a bit faster. Uh, but then I found that you know there's a lot of older classical music, but there's the modern ones. What I enjoy is from actually a game um, called Star Citizen, um, created by Chris Roberts, uh, who was the originator of Wing Commander. Uh, he had managed to actually enlist the help of a very, very good composer. Uh, who created the opening score of actually uh, the game itself. So his name is uh, Pedro Comacho, uh, probably not getting his name fully right. But it's a beautiful uh, theme of like, you know, the optimism of the game itself. It was created a long time ago, actually, I think published in 2015. Um, the game is still not released. Um, I'm still following the game with excitement, but waning after about <laughs> too long. Um, so. It is an interesting product to follow. Um, it's a case study one day, I'm sure. And that's why I chose the song. Like, if you are interested mm-hmm. in the field of product management, product creation, um, the game industry has a lot of things to teach us, actually, and mm-hmm. how they are doing it as a studio. Um, they have a lot of people working on this. And constantly, I see the innovation that they're bringing out into the industry is quite amazing to watch. So I, I chose a song for that. Mm. Yeah, I, I had a listen to the song as well. Um, it, it has it's got this really energizing feel to it. Um, it's uh, and like you said, I, I think the word that you use optimism is is that feeling that that you get uh, when you listen to the song. So yeah, I, I thought it was a movie at first when you said Star Citizen. Sorry, I'm not I'm not an avid gamer, so yeah. I, I, I'm not very. So then I went Google and said, Oh, Star Citizen is a game. So oh wow, but yeah, it, it was yeah. really really nice. So yeah, I definitely recommend it. And and the good part is it's not like super long. It's about five minutes. Um, and yeah, yeah it, it's it's uh, it's a very wonderful uh, masterpiece. Yeah. yeah. So thank thank you for that, Michael. Um, and and again, uh, some link up somewhere. Like, and I'm gonna point all over the place. Um, we've come to the end of the show. Um, as as always, this part where I wish we always had more time because no, no matter how long these sessions go on for, there never seems to be um enough yeah. time. So um, maybe. I would ask you, you know, Michael, as the last question to you, what advice do you have or what thoughts do you have? What do you want to leave with the viewers and listeners of the show um, today? Well, I guess if I can leave anything in my learnings as a product person over the years is um, take care of yourself, like mentally, physically, you know, make sure that you're well during this period of time. Um, mm. It's a hard job. There's a graphic that I've had, you know, doing this work is really like feeling that you're riding a bicycle that's on fire. It may feel that way sometimes. Um, try to reach out to people to talk about it. I think it's a, it's a lonely enough job sometimes that you mm. need to talk to people about this, right? So reach out to your friends, reach out to people like Colin, um, come on the show, request to come on the show, right? Make this the number one show in every country. Oh, wow. um, and, and you know, just just get going for that. Talk to people about it. Uh, share the knowledge that you have. Um, don't be selfish, right? Most of the stuff that we know isn't brand new, like so. Just keep sharing. I think that's that's the main thing, and help people understand the value of the work that we are doing. Uh, while it's not you know a profession like a doctor yet, but one day, who knows? Maybe this is important enough that people will start to really, really pay attention to this, and you'll be part of it. Yeah, it's right. a great feeling to be in. All right, thank you so much, Michael, for coming on to the show. And in thank you, Mr. Powell. <laughs> and in actual fact, it's uh, very interesting. Uh, it's very interesting because um, what he shared about 
is actually what I wanted to close with, right? Um, as we are still in this um, time of, you know, it's a very difficult time for us as humans uh, in general. Um, and I think we need to keep sharing. Um, this is something that I advocate about the product profession or the product management industry, right? Um, it's still very new. I mean, people say, oh, it's been here 20 years and all that, but I still think that we're learning so much um, and the only way we will grow, the only way we'll survive, and the only way we will continue to, to make an impact is by sharing um, and to keep supporting each other. Um, sometimes I know it's difficult. You feel like, you know, what if I share this? You know, it might be something that my competitor might take. But look, the whole world has, has grown together because people shared. Um, and I think we just need to keep paying it forward and we'll all be better for it. So yeah, if, I, if there's the, the one ending I wanted to leave with everyone today before I close is keep sharing and keep supporting each other. And until I see you at the next episode, please be safe. Um, and if you haven't gotten your vaccination, please go and get it quickly so that we can open the borders and we can see each other again. Thank you very much. And I will see you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>